Good afternoon. My name is Sharon Shep, uh, and I'm the Executive Director of the Florida Department of Citrus. Thank you very much for joining us today for FDOC's live webinar. We launched these um, last year in order to provide key information on a variety of topics um, to, our key, to our industry. So before we get started, I'd like to cover a few housekeeping rules. We uh, highly encourage all of you to participate today via Zoom so you can easily follow along with the materials being presented. If you're joining us uh, by telephone, you can download the information at fdocgrower.com. In order to make the presentation enjoyable for all, uh, we will mute everyone on, on Zoom. If there's an issue, I'll be the one to let you know. If you're joining via phone, please go ahead and mute your line. We will have question and answers at the end of the presentation. If you're uh, on Zoom, please click on the chat icon at the bottom of the screen and uh, type in your question. If you're on the phone, please send any questions by email to Shelly Rossiter at news at citrus.myflorida.com. I'll do that one more time. It's news at citrus.myflorida.com. At the end of the presentation, Samantha Lane will pull all those questions and facilitate the Q&A session. So on with the show. Today, we're gonna to focus on how to communicate with consumers in an area when misinformation is at an all time high. We will, start talk, we will start by hearing from uh, Alex Armentano, a Vice President of Crisis and Risk at our partner agency, Edible. Uh, Alex began his career, uh, communications career as a speechwriter and has spent the last decade helping companies, executives, and government institutions like ours protect and grow their reputations in the U.S. and internationally. Alex will provide us with an overview of how the current dynamics of consumer communications has significant implications for all industries. And then we'll hear from special guest, Teresa, Teresa Thorne, the executive, direct, executive director, pardon me today, at the Alliance for Food and Farming. AFF is a nonprofit organization which represents the organic and conventional farmers of fruits and vegetables and works to correct misinformation regarding agriculture in the media. The FDOC has partnered with AFF to bring its valuable resources to our industry and further our mission of promoting and protecting Florida citrus. Teresa will provide us with a behind the scenes look at how her organization fights back against misinformation with a specific look at the Environmental Working Group's uh, Dirty Dozen list, which sought to spotlight citrus this past year. Finally, we'll wrap up today's uh, webinar with a discussion about how the FDOC is approaching this issue. We also look forward to answering any of the questions that you have, and we're truly thrilled that you've joined us today. With no further delay, let me turn you over to Alex Armentano. Alex? Thank you so much, Shannon, and thanks to each and every one of you who've taken time to dial in today. Um, we know it's a busy time of year, and we appreciate it. I'm going to talk very briefly about the landscape, specifically the communications landscape, um, and sort of what we do in this regard as it relates to issues management and protecting um, growers' investment, the industry's investment in promotion, um, because we are living in weird times, to put it lightly. So we can go to the next slide. To define the misinformation era, some have called it an infodemic. There's a lot of different names for it, but the point is, is less about the amount of misinformation and really about its impact. News, uh, false news, inaccurate news travels farther, faster, and deeper in every category, often by an order of magnitude. This is a statement that just sort of captures the era. But again, we're gonna be talking about the impact of this information on commodities, on brands, um, on our industry. That's, that's why we're having this discussion. And so we can go to the next slide. Um, our team has been studying trust for about two decades. And so we just have a couple quick slides to level set um, and try to tell the story of this era through data. Um, noting the movement from 2020 to 21, 21 Trust in all information sources is at historic lows. And those sources, as you see on the right here, search engines, uh, when you're curious about something, you Google it. Um, traditional media, own media, social media. And note a very uh, 
thin dotted line there for most uh, for trusted between 60 and 100 anything that or above we call trusted not a single one of these sources um hits that threshold not a single one of these sources is trusted today and this is a major step shift this is very unique and very new next slide Let's talk about our sector specifically, food and beverage broadly. At the beginning of the pandemic, so between January 2020 and May 2020, um, trust surged. People had high hopes uh, and had real connections with these brands and had high hopes for um, what they would be able to achieve. This was largely driven by food producers and grocers, which is no surprise, um, thinking back to some of the buying habits, empty shelves, and stories and narratives we heard on the front end of the pandemic. Notably from May to January, uh, that dropped sharply. And that we think is a sign of volatile times um, that it's really hard to understand what this means for us looking sort of from a narrow period to another. So if we go to the next slide, we can think and see really, really big picture about how food and beverage is doing overall. Um, and the answer is, okay, food and beverage, because it's a lot easier to I guess, form a bond with your favorite uh, beverage or snack than it is, say, you know, an aerosol can of bug spray or whatever. Um, historically, its levels of trust are higher than that of business in general. What we'd call out here as sort of cautionary is it's stagnant and it's declining at a time when business in general, people's trust in business in general is growing. Um, and so we're on a bit of a crash course, thought about another way. We have a bit of an opportunity um, to really change that. But this is at a very macro level. You'll see the data goes back to 2012, how food and beverage is doing. And we can go to the next slide. Definitions are really, really important um, because, you know, misinformation, disinformation, all these things can be kind of weaponized against each other. And that's not really what we're talking about today. Um, but we do need to understand what it means. So we did a very simple um, semi-scientific plot here that just defines some of the things that we as communications professionals are used to and sort of what we deal in. Um, on the x-axis, we have authenticity. In the misinformation era, that word's coming up a lot as a way to measure how sort of real or fake a conversation is. Increasingly, that's kind of how we think about it. Um, and impact on the y-axis. So uh, at the bottom here, you have opinion. You know, I write an op-ed in the local newspaper and someone writes another one. And we respectfully disagree because that's what we do in this country and we're entitled to the First Amendment and free speech. Then there's factual error. Um, public relations or communications, people deal with this a lot. Someone gets something wrong, we call them, we correct it. Um, incomplete information. Maybe someone's taken an editorial position and only presented one side of the story. That's pretty normal too. As we climb and we get into words like misinformation, um, the sharing of inaccurate or misleading uh, narratives or disinformation, the sort of intentional sharing of that with, a, with an intent to do harm, it gets a little bit messier. Um, and this is really what's new. Uh, again, not that... Um, this has never been done or used before by people who have bad intentions, but about its impact. So we can go to the next slide. For us as an industry, um, for the food and beverage industry overall, things that we used to maybe call B2B or business to business, uh, sort of business related operational things, back office stuff, production, distribution, um, that's all now B2C. Consumers, because of social media, which I think we all kind of feel the impact and fatigue and weight of, um, these are everyone's issues now. And so this is a summary of headlines um, that kind of capture that, just the unbelievable breadth of things that our consumers care about, um, from carbon labels to a looming food crisis to food waste. This, these are the times we um, in food and beverage are in. And so we can go to the next slide. Important to note though, confusion's not new to nutrition. It's probably not new to anyone on this call. Um, narratives have been used for a while, even within the same publication, one day uh, something will kill you and the next day it'll save you. That's just the nature of the game we're in. And that's the nature of consumer communications as it relates to nutrition. 
Um, here's a summary of headlines that again will probably be pretty familiar, um, but that feel normal and have for some time. So confusion is not totally new. What is new, as we've said, is the impact that a false narrative can have. Um, on social media, a false story reaches 1,500 people six times faster than a factual story. It moves faster. Bad news travels faster. It has a greater impact. And if we think about this um, as, again, commodities or government entities uh, supporting those commodities or brands, um, this has like a real business impact. That's, that's different. And, and that's demonstrated here on the right. 60% of consumers will buy or boycott a product based on a brand's response to current social issues. Um, so again, it's not just about bad news spreads faster, but that it has a business impact, an industry impact. We can go to the next slide. So here are three sort of simple tried and true methods for communicating with consumers in these uh, strange and fraught times as it relates to how people obtain information about the, the things they like and the things they consume. Um, these are, we are intentionally simple and I would encourage you as you listen to Teresa, as you listen to the rest of this presentation, to just sort of earmark these um, when you hear about sort of what has and hasn't worked um, communicating as agriculture in this environment. These are themes, um, not just tactics, but themes we hope um, you'll see come up again and again in varying forms, sort of what not to do and, and what to do. So number one, go direct to consumers. Think about it like a game of telephone. A lot of the damage to business and industry um, is done the more, the longer the game of telephone is. Increasingly um, in our profession, in, in communications and public relations and speaking with the press, there's this movement toward going direct to sort of cut out the middle person or alternatively going to um, outlets that uh, are sought after by our consumers. No longer is it the big national newspapers of record. There's an outlet for everything, depending on what you care about. Um, we spend a lot of time on wellness specifically, and we'll talk more about that later, but go direct to consumers and speak to them in ways that uh, they'll understand, speak science to scientists and speak wellness to consumers who prioritize that. Number two, find friends. Um, the days of sort of pitching and getting a story are, are, are over in terms of um, impact. Now there's sort of paid amplification or um, putting a little paid spend behind good stories. There is um, sharing them on social media channels. Getting the piece of coverage you desire is really just the beginning of the journey now. Um, and so find friends, find friends who can turn up the volume on the issues you care about. Find friends um, who can help push back against things that are inaccurate um, where, where you can. And, and uh, we have one such friend on this call, you'll hear from Teresa. Uh, and communicate early, um, by all means communicate early. The idea of fact checking um, for communicators is obviously really important. It's important that, that the record is set straight, um, but research shows and experience shows that it's even more important to get to people um, before they see something that's misleading or inaccurate. So communicate early. Again, these are some very simple sort of rules for communicating with consumers in this time that we hope you see as a theme the more we talk through some examples. So we can go to the next slide. Um, this is the company that makes MSG, monosodium glutamate. Um, and it's a really interesting case because it's decades in the making. And this company in particular um, recently started to sort of take this on, but it's worth noting that since the 60s, this idea that MSG is bad for you um, festered, especially in the US. This company is not based in the US. Um, and so, you know, this idea of communicating early uh, wasn't necessarily um, what they, they did, but how they were able to change things is sort of this dual track promote and protect strategy. Um, promote by getting to the people who are most receptive to the idea, um, really going deep within the culinary community um, to talk about what this means for people who love food and flavor and umami for that matter. Um, and protect, to push back against things that really had a fr pretty flimsy basis in science. Um, and this is a case, particularly on sort of 
timing and not letting things fester or not letting that, to use the game of telephone example, um, get too long. So this is one such case that um, is encouraging in the sense that uh, it was able to really change over time. And some of the headlines here capture that. And we can go to the next one. California walnuts is another good example. Um, there is there there was as as there is currently with sugar this movement against fat, and so um, walnuts knew California walnuts knew that that was a barrier to consumption, and so they embarked on some research and they found sort of what people associate good fat with uh, those most receptive again olive oil avocados salmon um, and they found friends they created this thing team good fat um, and in a sense borrowed some credibility and, and found their way into the club uh, not just as a PR matter but because the science also supported it in fact supported it um, so again just a little quick perspective in these many cases um, and we can go on to the next slide so staying ahead, one theme, um, aside from the kind of three golden rules we talk about for communicating with consumers in this era, is that things were grounded in research and not just research on the science, um, which we spend a lot of time on as it relates to citrus, because there is so much of it. There is so many compelling uh, work about the, the benefits of such a nutrient dense beverage as 100% orange juice. Um, but also research as it relates to consumer perceptions. And this is a pretty recent one here um, that is really a teachable moment for staying ahead and really being attuned to how, what we're experiencing as an industry, what impact that may have with consumers. And um, we just put a tile of it here so anyone interested can look, but essentially um, the study says that people are supportive of uh, any solution to eradicate greening, but um, that they may have uh, concerns or confusion about the, the means for getting there. And so if we think about communications, um, that can be a very instructive, very powerful tool for how we talk about some of those solutions with consumers or even encourage acceptance by talking about kind of what's at stake, the impact the greening has had. So um, research, again, not just on the nutrition front, but on the consumer um, consumer attitudes front is, is a common theme through any real uh, communications campaign that communicate the benefits of, of, a, of a food category like this. So um, I think that was the last one. We can go on to the next slide, which I believe is over to our friend Teresa. Thank you, Alex. I appreciate that. Next slide, please. Um, I want to start out by saying that I appreciate greatly the Florida Department of Citrus giving us this opportunity to speak to you today. Um, I have a huge soft spot for the citrus industry. I am a very proud citrus farmer's daughter, born and raised and played and worked on a citrus farm in the San Joaquin Valley of California. And really, that's why I do what I do, um, working on behalf of farmers. So as Shan has mentioned, um, we represent organic and conventional farmers. The Alliance contributors are limited to farmers of fruits and vegetables, companies that sell, market, ship, or organizations that represent produce farmers. If you don't fall into that category, we're not going to take your money. We take no contributions at all from the pesticide industry. And again, that's, that's why we are credible in this space, because we truly are a farmer representative organization. Next slide. So our mission is really quite simple. It's to deliver credible information about the safety of all fruits and vegetables. And we wanna positively impact consumption by taking fear away from consumers, reassuring them about the safety of all produce so that facts guide their shopping choices. Next slide. So our core, core message is also quite simple. Choose organic or conventional produce. Both are safe and can be eaten with confidence. And we also want consumers to understand and always remember the decades of studies show the diet rich in, in fruits and vegetables leads to better health, longer life, prevents diseases, all of that good stuff. Next slide. So who's our audience? To Alex's point, uh, consumers. Um, we definitely emphasize moms, parents, uh, media, bloggers, nutritionists, and dietitians, uh, really everyone who eats. But with the nutrition and dietitian, they're up there because our consumer research over the years has consistently shown that in the space we work in terms of food safety and residues, nutritionists and dietitians are among the most credible sources of information. Consumers really believe them. And the reason for that is 
again, from our research, the nutrition message, the eat more message really is uh, very effective against the theoretical risk of residues. Next slide, please. So I want to start a little bit with um, results of where we are. We kind of measure the quality of our content uh, around the dirty dozen list. I want to say we're not just a moment in the spring um, where we're working on the dirty dozen list. These attacks really come continually uh, about the safety of produce regarding residues. And you know, we saw Consumer Reports do something recently where they had their own list. Um, and Dr. Oz just did something. And so we're really a year round push of our content through the Safe Fruits and Veggies campaign. But I wanna spend a little bit of time talking about the Dirty Dozen list today. And because and, again, that is a really measurable uh, moment in time for us. Uh, so next slide, please. Um, our messaging regarding the list, and keep this in mind because I'm gonna circle back and let you know how we do this, but the safefruitsandveggies.com website really supports this very simple messaging. Dirty Dozen list lacks scientific credibility and has been shown to negatively impact consumers and public health because it discourages consumption of fruits and vegetables. And I'm gonna circle back later and talk about how we support that, that message. Next slide, please. So when we launched the website in 2010, um, again, there was widespread coverage, but it was all EWG all the time. Um, the list authors enjoyed really enviable uh, media coverage, you know, all the morning news shows religiously covered it. Um, they had great broadcast, print, et cetera. Now, granted, media is different now, as Alex pointed out in his, his presentation. Things have changed a lot in 2010. Um, but again, a lot of very env enviable coverage that we were up against. Next slide, please. So today, through that continual outreach that I'm gonna go into a little more detail on and sharing of our science-based information, um, the Dirty Dozen List coverage has declined significantly. And, and by that, I mean, not only has the amount of coverage declined, but those impressions, which are harder and harder to measure nowadays, but still, those impressions have also declined. Um, but 60% of the media blogger coverage is now balanced or carries Alliance for Food and Farming messaging exclusively our content. Next slide, please. And we, as I just mentioned, have achieved one-sided coverage of our own in some publications that we never expected. Again, the Huffington Post was one of those outlets that religiously covered the Dirty Dozen list. They don't cover it at all anymore. Um, and so that's been a big win for us. Um, some of this is also due to our outreach and a lot of our work with the RD nutrition community. A lot of them are contributors to the Washington Post to shape eating well. And they've done stories, again, with our content and information. Um, so that's been a really um, big benefit to the Safe Fruits and Veggies campaign. Next slide. So in 2021, uh, the list was released in, on March 17. This is, these are the outlets that we would characterize as being more major, um, covering the Dirty Dozen list. If you think back to the slide I just showed you, uh, it's a lot of white space here. Um, more importantly, a lot of these stories are balanced or, again, uh, carrying our content, Miami Herald, exclusively. But I also want to print out, point out that, that broadcast has dropped off uh, pretty definitively um, since we started this campaign. CNN, Fox News um, don't do broadcast stories anymore. They do a story, but they put them up on the website. Um, and that lack of them doing videos or broadcast story is big because that means their affiliates located across the country are also not doing uh, showing video or including them in their broadcast. Next slide. So as uh, Shannon mentioned, um, Environmental Working Group targeted citrus this year. They did not put you on the list, but when you have a commodity that is popular among kids, and, and as we all know, during the pandemic, we were all eating more citrus and drinking more orange juice because, you know, high vitamin C content, trying to boost immune function. Um, so EWG found a way uh, to try and... Um, uh, jump off of that popularity, and they tested about 25 pieces of citrus fruit um, and then made some exaggerated, unsubstantiated safety claims. Um, we were, and I'm going to get to a little bit more specifics about how we assisted the citrus industry in response, but 
basically the citrus industry did not become a headline, nor did they become a main focus in any stories. If citrus was mentioned at all, it was toward the bottom part of the story. And so what this really showed us, and it was the same with raisins last year, um, the existing campaign with strategies, tactics, and networks, the, the communications, or excuse me, the nutritionists in place really benefits and successfully protects targeted commodities um, and more importantly, reassures consumers about safety. So next slide. So now I wanna jump into the how. How do we do this and how do we get those um, results and really diminish the impact of the dirty dozen list? The safefruitsandveggies.com uh, website developed by experts in toxicology, nutrition, medicine, risk analysis, farming. This is the cornerstone of our campaign. There is a vast amount of information on safefruitsandveggies.com. Uh, and I wanna go through a little bit of that for you today, but this really is our jumping off point um, for being able to uh, counter the misinformation out there regarding residues. Next slide. The most popular section of the website is the pesticide residue calculator. Um, we have tested, again, we rely a lot on consumer research and we have tested this message. Some of you probably have seen it in different forms, you know, the drop of water in an Olympic sized pool to try and really characterize how low residues are if present at all. But we really wanted to make it produce specific and we wanted to make it really visual for the consumer to really understand this message. So we went to toxicologists with the University of California Personal Chemical Exposure Program to do an analysis for us. And based on that analysis, we developed this tool. Um, so you go and you start calculating, and then the next screen will take you to uh, uh, where you can select your type, man, woman, teenager, or child. Then the next screen will take you to a screen where you can select your commodity. There's 21 on there. And then next slide, please. It will calculate up for you. You'll see that number kind of fun to watch. I, I chose kale. Um, it will in real time calculate up to that number where a child could consume 7,401 servings of kale in a day. Again, pretty dramatic stat. Um, and you'll see the start again button that, that will take you back to the commodity screen. Um, and we have many, many viewers to our website that do look at multiple commodities. Next slide, please. So, our information on safefruitsandveggies.com, we have a science and research section where we present peer-reviewed studies, government sampling data like USDA's pesticide data program uh, report. And we really, this is where we really try and um, submit those messages and validate those messages. I wanna point this uh, study out just because it's so dramatic. We went to some scientists and asked them what a lot of environmental groups and activist groups say is if you increase your consumption of conventional fruits and vegetables, do you increase your cancer risk? And what they found was absolutely and, and uh, significantly the opposite. 20,000 cancer cases could be prevented annually if half of Americans increased their fruit and vegetable consumption by a single serving each day. The beauty of this study is how concise that finding is. And it's, uh, we use it all the time in social media. Our registered dietitians love it, use it quite a bit. Um, and so that's been a really beneficial study for us because of that finding. Next slide. And you'll remember when I talked about the dirty dozen list messaging, right? It's scientifically not credible. Well, this is the study that really uh, solidifies that, excuse me, for us. Um, so this is from the Journal of Toxicology. Basically, they looked at the uh, suggested substitution of organic forms for conventional, as the Environmental Working Group uh, recommends, and they found no appreciable reduction in risk, largely because residues are so minute, um, and also overall list lack scientific credibility, which EWG themselves says in the report um, that they don't, uh, and, uh, there's no risk analysis that goes with this list. Next slide. And anecdotally, we have always thought that the, this type of messaging has got to have a negative impact on consumers. And this peer reviewed study came out of the Illinois Institute of Technology. They interviewed 500 low income consumers. And in fact, the result was a little bit worse than we thought. Um, the messaging regarding higher pesticide residues results in low income shoppers saying they'll be less likely to purchase any fruits or vegetables organic or conventional. This is the study that supports that negative impact of the dirty dozen list on consumers. Next slide. 
And we have much more on our website. As I said, there's a vast amount of information. We regularly blog um, covering that a wide range of topics that gives us the opportunity to push new studies, health and safety. We of course have videos, we have nutrition information from more fun facts to the more serious parts of it, safety standards. This is actually one of the more popular sections of our website, but we've brought together all of those government regulations, EPA, USDA, uh, FDA into one place. So people can easily see the um, organic and conventional pesticide standards in place to protect consumers, farm workers, and the environment. I have referenced surveys a lot um, among consumers and then influencers, um, registered dietitians. Um, we created an entire web page, which is really a website and a website for dietitians. To, so they have the most actionable information available to them. And of course, proper washing and handling advice, which certainly came in handy during uh, COVID. Next slide. So during the uh, Dirty Dozen list leading up to it, we really are continually pushing that content through multiple outreach tactics, ranging from blogs to webinars, to press releases, to direct email alerts, um, and, and, and obviously social media as well. Um, and we bring in our network of credible influencers to help broaden that outreach and disseminate our messaging as, and our members do the same. That's Alex's find your friends, right? Those are our friends. And, and again, they have a megaphone to consumers, which really helps push our messaging out. Next slide. So I wanna mention some of the tactics and, and help we provided and support to the citrus industry. Uh, obviously we had advanced warning that it was coming and they were targeting citrus. And so um, we made sure that the citrus industry knew about it as well. Um, we immediately contacted our third party spokesperson, gave them uh, the, the exaggerated and unsubstantiated claims from EWG and were able to get a statement from them. Uh, we alerted our networks of uh, nutrition communicators. Again, they hate it when uh, groups go after a popular fruit that they are trying to promote um, for, you know, again, in this case, uh, promoting immune function. Um, and we provided them with a safety messaging. Next slide, please. We included citrus-related studies. A new one came out from Harvard um, talking about how citrus berries and leafy greens increase longevity. Um, we pushed that out substantially. Um, we included the toxicologist statement on our national press release, and we provided ongoing media updates to the citrus industry. We aggressively monitor both social and mainstream during this period of time so we can pivot our information as necessary and needed, and we wanted to make sure the citrus industry was able to do the same. Next slide. So when we started and still today, odds are really stacked against us if you just look at it in these vast terms. Um, the Alliance for Food and Farming, we have a staff of two. Um, we are up against a staff of 60 with the Environmental Working Group. Our budget is 225,000 versus 14 million with the, or with the uh, excuse me, Environmental Working Group. And yet against those odds, our team continues to win. Um, and final slide. From me at least, I want to thank our supporters very much. Um, the Florida Fruit and Vegetable Association has been longtime supporters of ours. They serve on our communications committee. I want to thank our newest member, Florida Department of Citrus. Thank you, thank you. Um, your contribution will help us uh, quite a bit and we welcome you as new members and we look forward to working for, with you. Uh, and of course, California Citrus Mutual, Alyssa Halpy with that organization is our communications chair and California Citrus Research Board, again, a long time um, and, and important supporter of ours. So thank you so much for having us today and I will turn it back over to Alex, I believe. Thank you so much. And um, just a reminder of sort of why we do what we do and the impact of what Teresa described and getting facts out there. It's a lot of grunt work now because of the way people consume information and because of the way the media landscapes evolve. So if we go to the next slide, a reminder that um, this is the number of big top tier consumer headlines uh, about citrus and that special report that's here on the Dirty Dozen. Um, <laughs> we can go to the next slide. Um, so we talked about having, we talked about having kind of the promote and protect strategy, meaning one doesn't work without the other. 
fact checking till you're blue in the face as important as it is isn't the whole picture when you're communicating with consumers that you also have to promote the positive benefits and so we here just have some examples of how we do all those things um, we spoke about earlier finding a friend and, and meeting consumers where they are um, we talk about new research uh, of our own um, about the nutrient density uh, of, of orange juice and the wellness benefits. Um, so here's some examples of that. Um, and again, you can't have one without the other. You can't just defend and pick things apart. You also have to put your story out there. And that's exactly, exactly what we're doing here. So we can go to the next slide. Um, and some more examples just of the creative that um, the places FDOC is where consumers are and the places uh, we partner with to do that, Instacart, Walmart, Grocery. If you think about, especially during the pandemic, um, where people are consuming information, you know, largely right here on their phone, um, in a sense, what you're watching on Netflix is competing with what you're reading in the news, which is competing with the things you see when you order stuff. And so here are some examples um, of creative uh, from the consumer marketing program at FDOC that really hammer home and, and, and emphasize um, Again, the wellness benefits, um, the vitamins, minerals, nutrient density of Florida orange juice. So again, just some quick examples of how it all comes together. Um, I, I believe that's it slide-wise. Um, and now uh, we're doing pretty good on time. We'd love to open it up for any questions and, and have a conversation about this stuff. Great, thank you so much, Alex and Teresa. Um, great presentation, very informative. Um, we do want to open it up for a question and answer. As Shannon mentioned, if you have questions that you'd like to submit via email, please uh, email those questions to Shelly Rossiter. That email address again is news at citrus.myflorida.com. And so you can uh, send those there. And then if you're joining us via Zoom, feel free to uh, type any of those questions in the chat feature that you find along uh, right there in the center of your screen. And so just type any questions there. Um, and then uh, we will address any of those questions. And then if you'd also like to turn on your video screen and uh, do it in that format as well, you can raise your hand and we'll be happy to address you there as well. Shelley, have you seen any questions come through via email? Um, we did just have one question about whether this is being recorded and it is. So we will post this back up on fdocgrower.com um, once we have that all edited and finalized. Excellent, thank you. Any other questions? No. Wonderful. I have not received any questions via chat or in any other format. So it looks like Alex and Teresa, you have answered everybody's questions in advance. Um, actually, apologies, we just had one come through. Um, so there's a question from Peter Chairs. Are we at a disadvantage as an industry addressing negative press, wondering if consumers are naturally suspicious that a commodity group is biased and unreliable? Um, I'll take a crack at that and welcome everyone else to. Uh, no, I don't think the industry is at a disadvantage. I, I think um, if we, not to be so beholden to those three things, but I, I think they're valuable. Um, this idea of communicating with consumers on their terms, um, I think what I, what I do think is very, should be acknowledged about this question is consumers are suspicious about, um, he calls it a commodity group here, but uh, industry backed research even, anything that comes from industry is, is sort of self-serving. And um, that's kind of why we do what we do to as we said earlier, speak science to scientists and speak wellness to consumers and, and help find friends, help engage influencers and others that can create factual content that sort of tells that story. Um, the data at the very beginning about trust and the slow decline in the food and beverage sector and the complete decline of trust and in information sources um, does validate the second part of this question. There is absolutely suspicion out there. Um, and, and the first part about an industry and whether at a disadvantage, um, that's my personal opinion. I don't think so because I think all of these things are happening the way we've talked about, but I'll, I'll stop there and, and open it up to Shannon or Teresa. 
So, yeah, I would agree with what Alex said. You know, from an alliance perspective, our board has been really steadfast in ensuring that anything that goes up on that website is scientifically verifiable. It's either peer reviewed or it's been done by an expert in, in their arena. Um, so uh, that's been really helpful to us. We, you know, we took a lot of arrows from uh, Environmental Working Group and others kind of calling into question who we are and who we represent. And over time that's really diminished because we're walking the walk. But the, the use of third party spokespersons is really important um, to Alex's point. And again, that are for us, um, that includes toxicologists, scientists and risk analysis, et cetera. But then also that nutrition community, it's really constantly helping us to remind the consumer that you know, the best choice you can make every day is eating more fruits and vegetables. You know, that we're the only food group that health experts agree we should eat more of every day. So um, again, I think you have to have that support um, from third party spokespersons and outside influencers to help give you that credibility bump. Um, and again, stay in the science lane. That's exactly right, Teresa. I mean, and, and, and that's what the De Department of Citrus has always uh, looked at doing, but most specifically over the last few years, we, we've had tough issues that we knew could be could present themselves to this industry, especially in a time of greening and uh, in other uh, traditional consumer concerns. So it was important to us that that be extremely um, solidified, you know, very credible uh, peer-reviewed science that we can put out there with all the citations, um, solid science that, you know, that isn't made up, much of which hasn't even, um, hasn't, wasn't sponsored by us. I mean, uh, we, we've done thorough reviews of outstanding research um, that wasn't conducted or paid for through industry. So it's, it's definitely one of those things that uh, we focus on making sure that the science is absolutely the, the most credible it can possibly be before we put it out anywhere. Great. Um, Peter uh, just offered a thank you and said this was very helpful and an and informative presentation. Uh, we do have one more question from Rick Flagg. His question is, are any other groups besides the EWG targeting citrus? Alex, I'll turn that over to you. Yeah, thank you. I'm a morning listener every morning, so uh, I'm a fan and appreciate the question. Um, I, the issue, uh, EWG's issues about um, pesticides and, and chemicals and stuff, that obviously has a big constituency and certainly there are other groups that take that issue up. Um, as far as targeting citrus, I mean, that, that obviously is one we thought was worth addressing. Um, no other big ones uh, come to mind uh, at the moment, but I also, you know, I want to turn it over and make sure that FDOC um, has an opportunity, um, but it's a good question. And, and yeah, the issue has a huge constituency, but so does wellness. Um, and that's um, sort of who we aim to speak to on the uh, consumer side of things. Exactly. Um, we, we happen to be in a, in a place where we, we say it's lucky to be us. We're lucky to be us. Um, uh, we have an outstanding nutritional product that um, has been very beneficial, at least over this last period and, and, and certainly for decades um, in consumer refrigerators. So uh, there aren't many enemies of Florida orange juice. Um, but again, uh, appreciate the question, uh, Rick. We, again, another daily listener, you know, you're the morning listen. Wonderful. And I believe that wraps up our question and answer period. I don't see any other questions coming through. So uh, Shannon and I will turn it back over to you. Thanks, Sam. Uh, we, we enjoy the opportunity to be able to present this type of information in a broad basis for just about anybody to participate in. Um, this is uh, one of the positive aspects of working from home that we all learn now that we're all back in the office. Um, we're still going to continue to do this. We appreciate you taking the time to be with us. This will be recorded or is recorded, being recorded, and will uh, appear on our website sometime either later today or tomorrow um, for folks that didn't catch it today. 
uh, please don't hesitate to let us know if you have ideas for future website um, uh, or uh, webinar uh, presentations. And uh, please stay tuned for the next one coming from the Department of Citrus. We appreciate y'all being here today. Y'all have a great day.